Good morning, everybody, and welcome. We'd like to welcome everybody for coming. I hope everybody is having a nice morning. My name is Melissa Siegel, and I am the women's coach, the Central New Jersey women's co-chair for Israel with Marcy Robinson. First, I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. We have a great program in order. Our uh, guest speaker is Michal Uziahu from the Ishkal Community Center of the Gaza Envelope. And I would like to tell everybody to, that you will all be on automatic mute and you can send the chat of any questions that you might have to Celine Leeds. The, um, the program today will be recorded so that if you do have any questions or any comments or any issues with your um, computer or your internet, you can go back to see the recording. Today, um, I'd like to tell you that the, our participants have a great program in order. And if you have any questions, as I said before, you can uh, send them to Celine Leeds in the chat. Phyllis Solomon will be also speaking with you. And right now, I want to thank everybody for coming, the people from the central New Jersey region, the people from all the regions of the United States across the world to hear our wonderful guest speaker, Michal Uziahu. And now I'd like to uh, send the program over to Marcy Robinson. Good morning and welcome. 1901 is when it all began with Jewish National Fund, with a vision and a dream. And it's exciting today to look back at everything Jewish National Fund has accomplished because of you and because of me, and because of millions of people that came before us. We can look at the country from the very top to the very bottom and see the imprint and the power that Jewish National Fund has had on this incredible country we call home. Over 200 reservoirs created and funded by Jewish National Fund to avert a water catastrophe that was plaguing Israel just a mere 15 to 18 years ago. Today, there is no water catastrophe and Israelis are not just surviving, but thriving and creating global markets in agriculture that are leading the world. The dream was to create a homeland for all Jews around the world. And indeed, you can see the diversity and the fabric of Israel everywhere, everywhere you look. We proudly partner with Nefesh Benefesh, Soul to Soul, an organization whose mission is to assist the immigration of those from North America that wish to call Israel home on a permanent basis with citizenship. Everything from planning to orchestrating to finding employment to helping acclimate their newest citizens. Nefesh Benefesh is on the ground through our partnership, part of Jewish National Fund's vision and dream. Our work to improve the lives of our brothers and sisters in all areas of Israel include those living in the Negev, whose population has more than doubled. Today, Be'er Sheva is one of the fastest growing cities in all of Israel. This is part of our vision. This is part of our dream, yours and mine. We've made it happen. We've created everything from medical centers to neighborhood parks, to music programs, to provide inclusive outdoor areas so that all can enjoy. Yes, we started with blue box and trees, but we are so much more. It's having a dream, having a vision, and working to make it happen. That's what we do at Jewish National Fund. I may keep saying we, because that is truly what it is. We are partners with an incredible organization that allows us, engages us, and allows us to be part of planning, part of implementation, and yes, part of the enjoyment. Jewish National Fund is almost 120 years old, but I like to think of it as 120 years young because there is so much more to come. In fact, why don't you join me on a unique virtual mission to Israel? No passport needed, no packing, no jet lag, the week of May 18th with a guide live from Israel. Check it out, sign up, and jump on the bus with us. Be a part of the dream, a part of the vision. Jewish National Fund. JNF is your voice in Israel. Thank you. Hi, I'm Phyllis Solomon, a proud member of the Sapphire Society. I truly feel privileged to be a member of the Jewish National Fund Gaza Envelope Task Force. 
It has given me the opportunity to travel to the communities bordering both Gaza and Egypt. Our task force is comprised of a passionate, dedicated group of volunteers. And our mission is to provide safe, blast-proof community spaces for the residents of the Gaza envelope. We raise funds to accomplish this, as well as to create an awareness about the life in the area. It is one of the most gratifying positions I have been involved in. I often meet with residents in the area, and I have the unique experience of observing them as they go about their daily routines. As you know, they live with the constant threat of explosive balloons, kites, and rockets. They certainly understand the isolation that we are living with now. And now, as we are struggling in this critical time, they are reaching out to us, trying to give us the insight to deal with the loneliness of isolation and how important it is to maintain a sound mental health attitude. Talk about resiliency, they are the experts. We have built resiliency therapeutic centers in the Gaza envelope. That initiative has provided them with the skill sets and the tools to share in helping us during this period of time. So now they are our partners. We share in the joys, we share in the sorrows. We are one people. I welcome you to join in this Zoom partnership in this Zoom meeting. I sincerely appreciate your participation, and I'd like to ask for your renewed interest in all that Jewish National Fund provides to so many. Our feet are on the ground daily. Our impact is felt on many different levels. For example, JNF ensures that the elderly receive nutritious meals. Medical services continue to provide treatments and visits. Special needs children and adults have a continuous stream of activities that can enable their social and physical development. Israeli farmers provide produce for the whole country, but today they're facing a severe shortage of manpower. JNF to the rescue, we mobilize thousands of volunteers to help prevent the food crisis. New immigrants know they're not alone, we're there to help in their transition. We are people to people. Even in the midst of all that's going on today, there's a need to help, a need to give, a need to ensure that these life-sustaining projects continue to assist the very people who today have reached out to us in our time of need. You see, we are the doers, the donors, the partners, the affiliates, we have taken the initial steps in listening, but now it's time for us to deliver. We know the importance of ensuring the safety of the children and their families throughout Israel. Ladies, this is May, finally. This is Women's Month, and we are so fortunate to have an amazing, generous donor who will match our donations up to $1 million. Think about that. You will double your impact. You will double your effort, your energy. And it's easy. It's just a click away. Poof, your gift doubles. So think about these opportunities. These are our Women for Israel giving levels. For an annual gift of $360 a dollar a day, you join Women's Alliance. As you can see on the screen, an annual gift of 18 is the high society, and you receive a beautiful um, necklace. For 5,000, you will join the Sapphire Society and receive a beautiful necklace and also turns into a pin. So as you noticed in your chat, there is a direct link for your donation. This is a place for all of us. We are a community. We are JNF. We know these are very challenging times. We're all in this together but I know we're up for this challenge. Women for women, we can change the world. And as you can see on the screen, it's very easy, it's a click away. 
And now <clears throat> it brings me great pleasure to introduce Michal Uziahu. Michal is a trailblazer. Michal is married and she has three children. Michal is the head of the Eshko Community Centers, a community located along Israel's border with Gaza and Egypt. She is responsible for the region's community program management and strategic initiatives. Michal was born and raised in the Negev, and after completing her military service, she returned to work closely with Jewish National Fund on implementing the Blueprint Negev campaign while she was working for the Negev Development Authority. From 2011 to 2015, she was the Israeli emissary to the Jewish community in Denver, Colorado. When Merchal returned to Israel, the first phone call she made was to JNF CEO Russell Robinson. And she told him, Russell, my community needs help. My community needs JNF. Russell was just putting together the Gaza Envelope Task Force at the time. And he said to her, don't worry, Michal, we will be there for you. Well, that clinched the deal. We are the boots on the ground and we certainly show up. Now it's my extreme pleasure to introduce you to my dear, dear friend, Michal Uziahu, whom I also call Superwoman. Might I add that some questions will be uh, sent to chat prior to um, Michali speaking. Take it away, Michal. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Phyllis, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for taking the time today and joining us. Uh, I'm really excited to see so many people that uh, actually when you have so many issues to deal with the day to day and it's a Friday morning and, uh, and you chose to join us to this amazing uh, uh, gathering of Jewish National Fund family. So as Phyllis uh, mentioned, I was born in 1977. Uh, my parents were back then in Sinai and it was a time that uh, the, the parents looked on us, the babies, the new generation, and they were really hoping that by the age of 18, we won't have to serve in the Israeli Defense Forces. And unfortunately, they were all wrong, and, and we did serve proudly. Uh, in 1982, my parents had to leave their homes because Israel gave back Sinai to Egypt, and peace was more important than everything else, and they rebuilt their home just on the other side of the road, of the border. Uh, in a region called Eshkol. Eshkol lies on the border triangle of Israel and in, uh, in, uh, Gaza and Egypt. Uh, out, out of 60 kilometers of border with, uh, with Gaza, we share even more than 40 kilometers, which is a pretty, uh, uh, I can say 23 miles, about 23 miles of a border with Gaza and uh, 12 miles of a border with, uh, with Egypt. Uh, it's a wonderful region. I grew up in the days, despite all challenges, you know, it's the Jewish history, it's the Israeli history. And uh, I met a nice kibbutznik along the way that lived in one of the kibbutzim nearby. Uh, as some of you know, how I forced him to marry me after six years that he wasn't proposing. And together we built a family. In 2004, my daughter Shira was born. And I was working back then in the Negev Development Authority, which is a semi-governmental office that was really working very closely with Jewish National Fund in implementing the Blueprint Negev. Our goal was to bring more people, more Israelis to move, to live in this amazing region of this southern Israel. And it was amazing to see what you have accomplished. And when I say yeah, you, just like Marcy said, we are building the land. Yes, you guys. I remember every time that a Jewish National Fund a delegation and whenever Russell Robinson uh, used to visit, it was amazing to see the, the projects in the Arava Valley and in Beersheba. And, and it was really inspiring. Uh, even one day I, I had to fight over two million uh, shekels with Russell that decided that this 
two million shekels were, will be taken from one project that I was into in Mitzpe Ramon to Be'er Sheva, and I was furious. And I said, hell no, you're not taking my two million shekels. And they said, hell yes, Russell Robinson is taking it. And, and it was a project that I didn't believe in. I didn't think that there is any potential of throwing two million shekels into this project. And, and if you know this project today is the Abraham Well, It's a very successful project, an anchor project that really changed a, a very troubling area in Beersheba and made it into a very beautiful touristic area over there. And I had to admit that I was wrong and he was right. In 2011, I was fortunate to move, uh, to become the shlicha in uh, in the Jewish community in Colorado, and we have Barbara with us here today too, and a beautiful community. You know, I always say that I, I when I um, got to United States, I came as a proud Israeli and I converted into being Jewish too. Uh, you gave me so much of my Jewish identity and, and getting to know you and to see the love that you have for Israel gave me so much strength. Um, I will go back to Israel before. My daughter was born in 2004. <clears throat> it was a troubling time, I, I admit, but we didn't see the future coming as it was, as it is today. Uh, in 2006, uh, during the second Lebanon war, uh, um, Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier, was kidnapped just a couple of miles from where I live. And I gave birth to my two adorable boys, Ron and Ofri. And I, I assume that just like you look on the new babies that are being born today during the, this uh, corona emergency, it's very troubling to deliver babies during a wartime, during a crisis, because you're really asking yourself into what, what is this world that I'm bringing children into? And I remember looking on these two uh, few hours babies And I looked at them and I realized that I don't have my parents' privilege because I know that I will raise them to become soldiers. Um, you know, in 2005, when Israel did engage from Gaza and, and my daughter was with me at home, I was really all for the disengagement. I couldn't understand why Jewish people live in, in Gush Katif, right in the middle of Palestinian cities, I thought it was madness. I couldn't understand how people can raise children in harm's way. And I, all, I was all for the disengagement from Gaza. And we hugged the people of, of, uh, of uh, Gush Katif, but we really felt it, it was the right thing to do. We were hoping for peaceful time. We were hoping that the Palestinian people will thrive over there, but we were wrong. And in a few weeks, Uh, all the amazing infrastructure that were left there and it was American investment over there were burned and we woke up to a new reality, a reality of uh, what we called emergency routine. And having two adorable babies during such time when you sit at home with your babies and you hear rocket explosions and you have to run for the shelter every time that they shoot rockets, it's, it's, a, sad, it's a moment, it's a sad notion. But as a Jewish mother, I said to myself, you know what, it is what it is. I'm going to raise soldiers, but I'm going to raise my babies to be the most humane, wonderful, beautiful human beings, to be sensitive, not to hate, not to be hateful, but I will raise them to be tough and strong too. And raising these children, you know, when I have people just like me around me, it was Relatively easy, I have to say, because we, we had to deal with the same issues. And, and when, when we had to put some shelters above the rooftops of the kindergartens and it was layers of heavy cement, we took paint and we colored it because, because we, we are positive people. We are life-loving people and we are doing it together. And, and I remember even the first day that I took my babies to the, to the uh, nursery, Two rockets fell on the other side of the road and I just drove and I put the kids and went to work and not even thinking about it. But, yeah, but I admit that I remember one day when, when a rocket just fell next to us in the parking lot and, and a couple of days later, 
Amnon from uh, a kibbutz nearby died from a rocket attack, it was troubling. But I didn't think again, and I was moving along, and, and we realized that yes, we are fragile, and yes, we need to develop tools to survive and overcome this mad reality. A mad reality, as I said, it's a, a, what we call the emergency routine can be, just try to imagine one day it can be 150 rocket, one day it can be three rocket, and one day it can be 70 rocket. You don't know what to expect. You don't know if right now you're washing the dishes and the kids are playing outside and boom, you have to run. Siren goes off 15 seconds and you need to run for your life. And this reality, yeah, makes you fragile, but we started to realize that there are ways to overcome it and I will, I will be more uh, specific about it in a moment. But the real aha moment that I had was arriving to beautiful Colorado with this beautiful, amazing Jewish community. And I remember the first Israel Memorial Day that my son, Ofri, that was five years old, was asking me, Mom, I will have to go to the army, right? And I said to him, that's right. And the kids in my class won't have to go to the army, right? And I said to him, that's right. And then he looked at me and said, but I'm afraid to get hurt. And I couldn't promise him anything else. And I said to him, just like your great grandfathers and, and your grandparents and your, and your parents, one day it will be your turn to defend Israel. And he went to sleep. A few years later in 2014, there was the big operation, Operation Protective Edge. I was still in Colorado. The kids were visiting the family in Israel and my son is calling me and telling me, Ima, today I was riding my bicycle and, and the siren went off and I, I was 20 seconds from the shelter. So I just laid on the road and put my hands on my head and I couldn't understand how my eight years old back then could calculate what's a 20 seconds run and a 15 seconds run. And my husband one day is telling me, Michal, I think we're going to early our return to Colorado, but it really disturbed me because I said to him, Amir, I don't want the kids to feel that America is a refuge. You know that the only home that we have is Israel. And he said, you know, with all the respect, the kids needs you. But a day before they flew back to Colorado, my son asked him, Abba, next year when we go back to Israel for good, if the if things goes wrong, will we go back to Colorado? And he said, no. And my son looked back at the team and said, good, I want to go back home. And I realized that with all the vulnerability of knowing that there is a safe haven somewhere else, that you live in a community that is uh, going through tough moments, my son, my children still understand that this is home. And when we returned to Israel, it was after Operation Protective Edge, it was a tough time for our community, just to know, to understand, out of 4,300 rockets that fell all over Israel, one third fell in our community in Eshkol. It was a tough time. We lost our dear ones. We lost two members of our community. We lost a four-year-old boy from our community. One of our community members, Gadi, was severely wounded and lost both of his legs. And, and it was a tough time. But my children came back home. And after seeing how generous you were during Protective Edge, and then during this time I was calling the mayor and I asked him, do you need anything? You know, the American Jews are being so, so generous with us. How how can they help you? And my community didn't know what to ask for. And I realized that after 14 years of living in this emergency routine, it was back then, they didn't plan ahead. They didn't know even what to do in a week. They were living day by day. So as Phyllis shared with you, the number one call that I made when I landed in Israel was to Russell Robinson. And he came two months later. Knowing what you have done in the Arava, knowing what you have done in Beersheva, 
you transformed places. And you tr transform not only because you are being generous, you transform because you created this amazing organization together that is becoming a partner, not a supporter. You become a part of a family. And from this moment that Russell visited us and shared with us that there is an amazing new delegation, a new task force that is called the Gaza Envelope Task Force. And they arrived on March, 2016. From this moment, we became a part of a family. And we are having here today Phyllis, that is one of the founders of the task force and Betsy Fisher, that uh, is the chair of this task force. And I want you to understand what a task force force is task force means a group of people just like you that comes to israel once a year sit with us and think with us what should we do how can we better our life you know when russell first came to a school and he asked the mayor what do you want the mayor said you know what i want subsidies for people to come and move to live in a school and russell said great it's all about blueprint negative how can we bring no more people but you don't want to give the money because if you give money to people to move and live in your region, two rockets will fall and then we run back to Tel Aviv. You want to give them quality of life. And I'm here to be with you hand in hand and to give you quality of life. And Betsy and Phyllis, and we have with us also, I see on the screen, and Zimmerman and Barbara and and, and I'm sure that I'm missing, we have Nina Paul that is very much involved and, and is doing amazing work with other task force. They come and sit with us and make us think together, how can we better life? The first project that they chose was the resilience centers. And here comes the real thing that I wanna share with you. If we wanna move also to what, what is this amazing thing that you can take with you to deal with the coronavirus crisis that we are doing today. Because the Resilience Center is not only a place, the Resilience Center is, is an is a understanding, it's a, light, a way of living. Resilience Center is a place that first gives therapy, therapy one-on-one -on -one to people. It gives support to children that suffer from PTSD, from all the rocket attack that we suffer. And Phyllis mentioned the terror balloons and the kites and the fires that we had and the terror tunnels that we need to deal with every once in a while too. But we give therapy and help people when we're saying you are not alone. But the Resilience Center is doing something else. The Resilience Center is, pre uh, Center is preparing us for the next emergency. It helps us, the leadership of each community, the leadership to prepare ourselves to be ready when the next escalation is coming. It helps us in different programs to remember that we are together in it. Now I want to stop with my personal story and I want you to think about the last moment that you felt that you are so stressed. Think about it for a moment. A moment that you feel, felt that you are stressed. The first thing that you feel when you are stressed, you feel that you are alone. You feel that no one understands you. You feel that you have to deal with the situation, but you don't know even how to start. The Resilience Center is a place that reminds us that we are not alone. Because when we suffer from a tremendous stress, we can look right and left and to see people that if we will ask for help, they will be there for us. Because when we suffer from rocket attack, my neighbor is suffering from the same issue. And when I need help, I have a community that will support me. And think about it. Think about how you need to deal today with the coronavirus. Think about how many people are at home feeling alone but if they will pick up the phone and call someone, call you, they will know that you are not alone. From the moment that the task force, the Gaza envelope started to work, they reminded us not only with the program that they support, but with them being on the ground with phone calls, with email constantly, that we are not alone. And they always told us, raise your head up 
and plan ahead. And when, whenever we planned something small, they said, no, plan bigger, because we are with you looking forward to the future. Don't live every day, day by day. We want you to plan for the future. We are with you. We are holding your hand. You're not alone. I want to share with you one of the last emergencies that we had here before the coronavirus. It was 4 a.m. I, I had a co phone call saying, Michal, immediate evacuation. We are starting a, an emergency. Evacuation meant that we had 60 ninth graders camping outside and we had to evacuate them because the, there was a big attack uh, coming soon. That couple of days, I think we had more than 200 rockets um, uh, on our communities. But that moment, that morning, 4 a.m., I had a phone call for the emergency. 6.30, I already had a phone call from Jewish National Fund, from you guys, saying we are here for you. We want to help. And look now on this amazing room that we are having, the Zoom call that we are having. Look how many people we have here, 67. Believe me, each and one of these people that are with us in this phone call, if you will call them and say, I need help, we will be there for you. Even if I don't know you, please text me, I will be there for you. Because I know that we are together and together we can overcome any challenge. The reason our community not only surviving through these already 20 years of constant emergency routine, the reason we survive and also grow, more people join our communities because people want to belong to communities. People want to take part in this amazing thing that we are creating and we are creating this with you every day. Because ever since the first time that the task force arrived to Eshkol, and helped us with the Resilience Center. You already are building now the third Resilience Center in this area. You also helped to open an indoor playground in Sderot. We are building this amazing playground today with the great help of, of you guys in a school. It's called the Play School, King, Play School Kingdom. You are helping in water reservoirs. You are helping with medical centers. You are helping with housing fund, with housing for new families to move here. You are part of everyday life in a school. And when you come here to visit, and I hope that you come soon to visit here, your footprints are everywhere here in a school. And beside, as I said before, and I want to end with this message, besides supporting us, you create here a supporting group of people that belong to each other, a family, a Jewish National Fund family. And I want you to remember, together we can overcome everything. The way this community, our community, dealt with the coronavirus in the last few days were amazing. It was amazing because the first moment that we had to get into lockdown, we helped each other. We helped the people that are most vulnerable, elderly people, people with special needs. You were there every moment. And we were there every one moment for each other. But we couldn't have done it if we didn't have your help in rebuilding our communities. You arrived after Protective Edge when this community was completely broken and you helped to form everything to hold us up and help us to look for the future. The last comment that I'm going to make before we open it to questions and, and comments, please. I want to share with you a special story about a special person that Betsy Fisher is writing a book about him, the mayor of Eshkol, Gadi Arconi. Gadi, during Protective Edge, was, uh, was the head, the economic head of uh, two kibbutzim. And in the last hour of Protective Edge, just before the ceasefire, he went with a couple of friends to fix an electric wire before the nightfall. There was a direct hit earlier that day in an electric wire and there was no electricity in the kibbutz. The last hour before ceasefire is the most dangerous moment. Before ceasefire is the time that the Palestinian, the Hamas, will shoot the most rockets on our communities. And Gadi didn't know uh, that the ceasefire is coming and he went to fix the, the wire. And as he was approaching there, there was a massive rocket attack. In his kibbutz, we don't even have 15 seconds. And the siren went off. They were running for the shelter. 
and a rocket exploded between Gadi's uh, legs, a mortar shell. But Gadi was lucky because as I told you before, Gadi lost, he is the guy that lost both of his legs. But his friends received most of the shrapnel and two of them died right next to him. Gadi could uh, feel sorry for himself, focusing himself in his recovery, but he didn't. Uh, despite the fact that the doctor said to him that he will never walk again, after six months, he came back and showed them that he's not only walking, he's running. Less than a year after his injury, Gadi became to be the mayor of a school. At this moment, Gadi understood, yes, I experienced a crisis. I lost people that I love very much, but I'm going to run forward because I have responsibility and I have an amazing community. And Gadi is the true vision, I think, of Eshkol, but the true vision of Israel and the Jewish people. Yes, sometimes it's hard, but we should look right and left. We are not alone. We are leaders. We move forward. We are life-loving people, and we will never give up. We are here to stay, overcome any crisis, include the coronavirus, and we will win together. And I look forward to meet you in person. And I want to thank you. And thank you, Marcy, for this great opportunity to share my story with you. Toda raba. Okay, Michali, as usual, thank you for sharing many, many days in the life. And uh, I, I know that the rest of my um, group from the task force thanks you for uh, including us in the partnership. It's, it's truly an honor. And uh, now we have some questions for you, which I know you will handle with great ease. And for those of you who are chatting your questions, we will do the best that we can to include them. So in advance, thank you for your participation. Okay, Mikhali, first question. What are the skills that you use on a daily basis to help keep your community members calm and resilient? Interesting question. <laughs> uh, first, preparing, preparing. Uh, when you are prepared, when you train, when you think and, and tell yourself, okay, in the next emergency, how can I do things better? When you are prepared, you can overcome the, the, the crisis, the emergency when it comes. But also, you know what? Uh, uh, I, I will move for the, for the side for a moment and then go back to your question. I, I saw an amazing movie, it's called Nation in Stress. I shared it with some of you uh, in the past. And it talks about you Americans, about the fact that your life expectancy is dropping in the last uh, uh, few years uh, because people experience a lot of stress. Uh, uh, people commit suicide, die from uh, overdose of uh, opioids. And, and when they looked on the trends with the Hispanic American community, they didn't see the same trends. And they said that the two main elements that were different with the Hispanic uh, community was that they have a very strong community support and community cohesion. Again, going back to what you are doing in our communities with the Resilience Center, these are two key elements. Now, so as I said, preparing for emergency, knowing your routines, knowing that how you take care of your communities, being in, in doing mode, knowing that, okay, I'm in emergency, my responsibility is to take care of the elderly people in this community, and his responsibility is to, to, to um, uh, maintain a constant uh, information, uh, giving uh, accurate information for my community. Each one has a role. Preparing is a lot. Second is community support and community cohesion that we are doing all the time. And third, and this is something that is very important to emphasize, listen to the instructions of the leadership. It's so important. We see it now with the coronavirus. When you listen to instruction, instruction save life. And I know that sometimes it sounds that the instructions are weird that we don't understand them. 
but listen to the instructions. It really helps a lot. Today in Eshkol, we had, since the beginning of the coronavirus, we had only six sick people in Eshkol. All of them, once they felt bad, they were in lockdown and the entire community took care of them. We took care for food, for the rest of their family. We were there for them to support, but we have to listen to instruction, to cover your face, to wash your hands. We constantly repeat it with the community because it's important. So this is my um, really a, a very important message to you. I think uh, we should all listen to the instruction. And as I shared with you, Phyllis, before, since we listen to the instruction, life are getting back to track a little bit more in Israel. And today I did my hair, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good thing. Michal, we're all looking forward to that day, trust me. <laughs> okay, the next question, which we just got in. Um, the world is currently in a state of isolation. Do you have any advice for the women who are now working from home and also acting as teacher, cook, housekeeper, wife, mother, and employee? Wow, it's a very good one because I deal with it too. Uh, I will go to, first of all, to a very important method in resiliency, okay? Uh, each and every one of you need to think what are the things that uh, strengthen our resources. If you wanna run a marathon, you know that you need to work out. Right? You need to go to the gym, you need to run, you need to each time to uh, run a little bit faster and, and further. And, and you to, if you want to be in good shape, you need to go to the gym. Right? If you want to be resilient, you have to work on your uh, resources. So each one of you need to think what, is a, what helps to bring more resources to me. For me, it's working in my garden. For me, it's listening to good music. Think about what are the little things that really gives you a place of comfort and re, re bust your energies, okay? And try to take these little things into your day-to-day -day life. In between cooking and cleaning and working, Listen to a good music. In between these two, open the window and look on your garden. Look on the flowers. If it's something that gives you resources, do it. It's the little things that makes you break and it's the little things that helps you to reboost your energies. So try to think and make a list for yourself, even in your purse. What are the little things that you can do? A special song, something to eat, carbs. I love carbs. It gives me so much energy. So think about the little things that are not dependent on anyone else that you can use and use this. Second of all, remember that uh, there are great gifts that this coronavirus gave you. And think, what are the gifts? For me, working from home while screaming on my children here when they interrupt my Zoom calls, uh, for me, it's still a moment that I got to know my children even better than what I knew them before. Uh, it's this little moment that we can create and think about also what are the gifts that the coronavirus gave us and that you really wanna take with you further. Sometimes it's okay to work from home. The last thing that I wanna say to you, don't be so harsh on yourself. We are all, you called me a superwoman, we are all superwomen. We are all pushing ourselves to the edge Let's remind ourselves that sometimes it's okay to be a witch. Sometimes it's okay to be a, not the Wonder Woman, but the, the, the mean woman. It's okay. And we should uh, be more easy on ourselves. So uh, this is my best three tips for quality of life. Thank you, Michal. Um, another question that you answered for the women. And here's another question as a community leader. In your role as community leader, can you cite some examples of how you manage as a community leader and Gotti, the mayor, and how Gotti manages and Lee Moore and all our friends throughout the uh, envelope, 
how do they manage to help others in creating a sense of routine in controlling and not controlling, but in helping to assist others leading their lives? First of all, I have to say that we work a lot on, on it too. We're, and we watch each other back too, because uh, when you are community, when you are a leader in your community and, and going through crisis, uh, if you are not strong, the community won't be strong. Think about, uh, we see it also with the Resilience Center. Whenever children are coming and ask for a therapy, when I came to the Resilience Center first time because my son was 11 years old and wetting in bed, and, and, and I said, I want you to give my son a therapy, and they said, no, I, we want to give you a therapy. Uh, you need to be strong. So, uh, and if you will be strong, not only your son will be okay, the two of your other children will be much better too. And we see it also in a community. When you have a strong leadership in each and every one of our communities, when the leadership is strong, the entire community is functioning and, and is strong. And, and when the leadership of the re region is strong, the entire region is functioning and, and being strong too. In this coronavirus, I have to tell you that one of the things that we really insisted is we are not doing things for the community. We are doing things with the community. Because if we want to overcome, and this is not a, a sprint a run, this is a marathon. This is a long run that we are having here. We need to keep our resources mm -hmm. and we need to give people uh, the, the, the gift of being meaningful too in their community. As much as we will have more people active in the community, they will feel that they are much more meaningful, they will feel that they are belong, and they will feel resilient too. Uh, so giving the opportunity for people to do themselves and do it with them, um, just that uh, before Yom Ma'ut, we felt that one of our communities is collapsing and they were not even planning to do anything for Yom Ma'ut, for Israel Independence Day. And we were calling them day by day, every day. We are with you. Let's do it together. We, we insisted not to do it for them. Sometimes it's easier. Think about it with your children. Sometimes you can just do it for your kid. But when you do it yourself, when the kid is doing it himself, he feels so much stronger, so much capable of doing it. And this is the best thing that we can do. Phyllis, you know the story about um, the rocket that fell just before Passover. And, yes. and, and when, when the uh, father and his daughter were walking outside and the rocket fell in the community and the father told his daughter, run home, I'm going to check if someone needs help. And, and the daughter, went back home and she was collapsing. The mother didn't know what to do. She wasn't functioning, she wasn't responding. But lucky enough, the mother had a, 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 a training in the resilience center a week before, and she had a little note uh, in her purse. How, how can she help a person in trauma? And she said, okay, the first stage was to open a communication line. And she said to her daughter, let's pick up the Lego from the floor. So the daughter was still sobbing and crying and traumatizing, but she was functioning. And the mother went to the purse and took the little note and she started to take her daughter from one stage to another, really helped her. So what happened in this situation? It's not that we helped with the therapy to the children, child, the mother helped and she felt capable and stronger and her daughter felt so safe in her mother's arm that her mother knows what to do when, when she needs help and this is what we are doing so this is this is it's the best thing to do i think is to have more and more as much as people engage as possible Mahali, i think we've had uh, addressed as many questions as we can I think the lesson learned today is that all skills are transferable in all times of crises. And you have given us a tremendous uh, eye opener in terms of how do we handle this? How do we go forth? And uh, to use what you are doing at the resilience centers as a role model for all of us. So I thank you. We all thank you.
this has been a momentous Zoom and empowering event. Firstly, thank you, Mahali. I love you so. The miles no longer separate us. You have inspired us with your devotion to your people. Your dreams do come true most of the time. And I thank you for your steadfast loyalty and caring for all of us and wanting to assist us during this time of Corona. Shabbat Shalom, dear friend. Hope to see you sooner than later. And now I think we have some slides that are coming up for our Zoom meetings in the future. As you can see, we are trying to reach out to the community. We have something for everybody. Uh, on Monday, Marina Furman, who was a former Soviet refusenik, sorry, lost my words, uh, is running a wonderful Zoom. And you can see we have a cooking class and then ladies night out on Thursday, May 14th. Um, please make note of this. We are so lucky to have these magical people who know how to make us feel better. And uh, all will be mailed to you. You can pick and choose those that interest you. We are really trying to help our donors, our friends, and the community at large to fill their days with meaningful recreative activities that will provide a sense of well being to get through this corona crisis that we're in. And to all of you, you very beautiful women who are out there, you showed up even though your hair color might have faded like mine. I'm really a redhead, but I went blonde to help this through. You took the time, you showed up, you took the time to join us in friendship, you took the time to join us in a partnership. And I want to thank you, a double thank you, for your gift that I hope you will make after this Zoom. And know that your gift is one that will make a difference, one that stands out, it doubles the light that it brings to others. And I wish all of you to stay healthy. Thank you for joining us. Safe distance on your way home. Shabbat Shalom. Till we meet again, and I hope that will be very soon. And have a wonderful weekend, everybody. And this meeting will conclude now. <laughs>